Dear students, welcome to EPG Patshala. We are discussing today the course on social policy and my name is Sohini Sen Gupta. I am an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. The module in social policy that we will discuss now is called the theoretical perspectives. Here we will discuss the broad theoretical perspectives that have influenced the emergence of social policy in India and elsewhere in the world. The objective of this module is specifically to understand the theoretical base of social policy, to learn about different ideological perspectives that guide social policy. In general, these perspectives are usually hidden and you will not find them anywhere mentioned clearly in social programs. We analyze how these perspectives have shaped welfare provisioning all over the world through time. Let's begin. Let's start with the first perspective, which is called liberalism. Most of you are familiar with this because this is one of the most commonly available perspectives that define social policy all over the world. This ideology regards individuals as free, rational and moral being worthy of equal respect. It therefore believes in free market as well as private property, existing with a limited state. Now, you might ask, what has this got to do with social policy? Where does it take us? When we consider individuals as free, rational, moral beings who are worthy of equal respect, that sounds like a perfect premise for creating a social policy that would create that kind of equality which otherwise does not necessarily, automatically, naturally exist in all societies. However, the issue is that it also believes in freedom and freedom includes here the idea that states should not be interfering individual liberty and their ability to uh, use the market. It should not also interfere with the liberty of the market to rearrange, organize and redistribute goods and resources as it thinks fit. The state in liberalism should not interfere with individuals liberty and rights with the exception of trying to protect others from harm or safeguarding their freedom. Therefore, from a liberal perspective, government should only perform a protective function through welfare. It should not perform a social policy to such an extent that it leads to infringement of individuals liberties and freedoms and excessive interference. So liberal ideology means limited social policy. Neoliberalism is a strand of social policy as the name suggests neo it has emerged recently. Neoliberalism is a radical form of liberalism. It questions the view that the state should play any role in provisioning at all. During the post-war period, nation states were economically deprived as governments redirected resources to state-based protection of vulnerable people. This is the idea that neoliberals have, that the governments have actually, by spending money on welfare of poor and vulnerable, redirected resources from entrepreneurial activities in the free market. So instead of allowing the market to grow, which would have led to economic growth and wider prosperity in the society, they have actually taken resources away and put them for welfare, interfering in a fashion that was probably not a very good idea if one was looking at improving people's living standards over a long period of time. It also disagrees that heavy taxation should be created by states which are required to sustain welfare provisions. Remember in the last module we talked about social expenditure, government needs to find money to pay for welfare services it provides for people. Heavy taxation according to neoliberals has a negative impact on private sector investment. So if governments interfere too much with the market or taxes people too much and take away incomes which people are earning to do welfare, then it's not necessarily such a good thing. From this perspective, public welfare systems are expensive, inefficient and unnecessary and should be cut back to allow space so that people can exercise their choice and avail of their services in whichever from whichever sector they, they desire to do. Neoliberalism therefore asks for little or no role of the state in creating welfare for people. Marxism, moving at a radically different end of the continuum, let's look at Marxism. What does Marxism have to say about social policy? Not very good things I'm afraid. According to Marx, the stock structure of a society is determined by ownership of resources for maintaining social life. 
means of production, according to Marx and Marxists, is unequally owned by different groups and people in a society. Human history is a series of struggle, therefore, between people who have the ones who own or control means of production and the ones who have been historically deprived of such control and who constitute the oppressed class. Capitalism, therefore, in all forms and shapes, with or without welfare, is essentially unjust because it creates oppression for people. And since capitalist societies are unjust, doing welfare or not doing welfare does not lead to liberation or well-being for people at all. So under Marxist critiques, the welfare state only serves to stabilize capitalism by meeting its economic requirements. It feels less for people and their needs and more for the survival of capitalism and its institutions. Take for example, health and education policies. According to Marxists, health and education, when it's provided freely by governments to its citizens, only ensure a steady supply of workers for industry and commerce, reducing the cost of reproducing labor power. So state therefore subsidizes industries, state subsidizes capitalist concerns. It does not really care for the well-being of people. While capitalism is unstable and therefore ideally when there are no jobs, workers should feel unhappy, oppressed should feel their oppression very hard and that should lead to a social transformation. State welfare role irons out these contradictions in capitalism by helping to sustain um, capitalism. And therefore, uh, according to the Marxists, there is nothing good about social policy and it should therefore, uh, they have only reasons to believe that it serves the need of those who have. Neo-Marxists, however, which is a variant of Marxism, just like neoliberalism is a modern variant of liberalism, do not think the same way. They do believe that in modern societies, social policies have a progressive roles to play in redistribution and creating justice. But we won't talk about it in detail here. Let us look at some more familiar forms of ideologies like social democracy because India is a social democracy or it was still recently. Social democracy, much like socialism, believes in the values of liberty, equality and fraternity, much like the liberals. Social democrats are individualist rather than collectivist whereby they stress on the liberty of individuals so that they may uphold their individual rights while also supporting the restricted role of the state. The idea and the argument is, of course, can, you, can individuals uphold liberty? Can they exercise choice? Can they really truly be free if their wants and their needs? And remember in the beverage report, the four or five giant ills, especially poverty, is not addressed. Social Democrats concerned with mitigating the effects of inequality through social arrangements to prevent people from suffering the worst consequences of the market rather than removing inequality itself. So although they believe some amount of inequality is inevitable in all societies, especially in modern societies, they do not want people to suffer from the worst consequences of the market. So they are in a way, a variant of liberalism. Feminist perspectives. Feminist perspectives on social policy emerged far more recently in time because they were concerned about women's equality. Although social policies are meant for all citizens in all countries and all nations and all governments want to create equality, there is something fundamentally different about equal inequality based on gender. According to the feminist, social policy need to be concerned about gender relations if they want seriously to talk about so equality and justice. However, most social policies have been gender blind and they have only tried to create egalitarian relationships in the public sphere or in the marketplace or in the workplace or in industries or factories, ignoring the subordinate, subordinated roles that women sometimes play in the sphere of home, which is called the domestic or the private sphere. Within feminists, there are various versions um, and not everybody, not all of them agree with each other in terms of what social policy should be doing about women. Liberal feminists advocate equal participation of women in the public sphere and this is reflected in the social policies that are informed by liberal feminists 
yeah because they promote equal employment rights equal pay as well as anti-gender discrimination at workplaces many countries in the world today have equal opportunity policies um, countries like the united kingdom have an equal opportunity policy countries like australia have a policy that prevents uh, organizations from discrimination based on gender at workplace uh, in India we have a uh, sexual harassment at workplaces law so all of these policies are essentially meant to ensure that the barriers that women have traditionally and historically experienced in working uh, in the public sphere is removed so that they can become equally um, they are able equally to benefit from uh, whatever it is that the market economy produces in terms of jobs or growth. Welfare feminists are more concerned with affecting and improving the private sphere of women's lives which remains an invisible or more hidden aspect of women's life while the public sphere is quite visible and one can promote social policies like equality of pay, removal of discrimination, etc. We don't know much about what's happening to women when they're performing non-monetized roles, caring responsibilities as mothers and wives and daughters at home. In recent times, uh, feminists have argued that caring roles that women undertake in their households should be monetized or should be accounted for because without doing that, we are unable to say and we are unable to account for the contribution of women to society and economy. However, not all feminists agree with that. Marxist and socialist feminists criticize the assumption based on the existence of natural difference between men and women. They argue that welfare has played a crucial role in maintaining the subordination of women at home and maintaining the gender division of welfare which are seen as a mean to reproduce class relations in the marketplace. How does this actually work out in practice? What happens is when women are undertaking caring responsibilities in the domestic sphere, that is they stay at home, they look after the children, they do cooking and cleaning, they take care of the sick, they take care of the unwell, they do large number of activities through the time, through their lives. However, there is no protection that is provided to them in case they, may f in case they fall sick, in, in case they are asked to leave by their families, in case they are abandoned, in case um, they suffer from a disability. None of these factors are accounted for because the idea, the, because of this whole notion of the invisibility of women's work in the private sphere. On the other hand, this free work that women provide in the private sphere actually subsidizes the workers, including the children who are growing up and getting educated, the old people who are getting taken care of, uh, the men who can go to work. This subsidy that they provide through their free work is actually enabling um, the others to fulfill their roles in society. In the absence of women taking up this caring responsibility, who would actually provide for these valuable goods and services? Marxist and socialist feminists would argue that these valuable caring services should actually be provided by the state. So in many socialist countries, therefore, caring responsibilities were given to the state and children would be looked after in crash facilities managed by, by governments or by councils or by municipalities, while women would be free, just as men, to go out and work. And the work that they then do will be accounted for through equal wage legislations, equal opportunity legislations and other things. But as long as women stay in this invisibilized sphere. They continue to subsidize the market economy, but there is no acknowledgement of um, the work that they do or the contribution that they make to society. There is a far bigger problem with this, which is essentially the cultural and the social stigma that is also associated with people who don't earn their living in modern societies, which makes women kind of second class citizens because you know they don't earn a living. Welfare feminists would argue that it does, states don't have to take over the caring responsibilities, but it can be purchased in the market. So women could be free to work, 
and with the wages that they earn as long as you make the workplaces equal the wages that they earn can go into the buying of services and goods in the market including crash facilities or daycare services and schools they could of they could invest in better schools which keep children in for longer hours they could pay for health services they could pay for medical facilities care for the elderly so they would argue that the state does not necessarily have to take over caring responsibilities but women can have equal wages and better opportunities and good education so that they can earn enough to buy these services in the market now these are the major fracture lines between different types of feminist ideas within feminism but they are highly relevant for social policies because especially in the context of india where women's labor force participation is is very very low women also continue to face barriers at home and at workplace in attaining their potential the representation of women in higher education institutions and also in secondary schools continue to be quite low compared to men and in certain geographically remote parts of the country and in certain socially disadvantaged group the share of women in in both in work in better paid jobs as well as in higher education remains very very low so feminist perspectives on social policy remain very relevant in the context of countries such as india to design social policy we have to also talk about the influence of new ideas such as postmodernism on feminist thinking postmodernism basically the feminists who believe in postmodern ideas believe that modern social policies have been not only gender blind but also blind to the needs of different cultural groups different race and uh, disability uh, sexual orientation and therefore their policies have been uniform and such uniformity does not serve to create either equality fairness social justice or redistribution because a really good social policy should be able to factor in these differences and differential relationships that exist within groups of women all over the country therefore the needs of western women need not be the same as women who live in sub saharan africa or women who live in india or in other parts of south asia and social policy to be really effective need to take into account these different needs and these different types of disadvantage disadvantages that go with these different uh, identity formations to which women belong feminists broadly desire to include the private sphere in the reckoning uh, with the state and the market they want to include issues like divorce abortion child care uh, domestic violence etc as part and parcel of welfare policies because unless this division between private and public sphere is dissolved it is impossible to really understand what kind of social policy measures are needed to create equality because you cannot have equality in society without gender equality new ideas along with feminism the other new ideas and which is a very prominent and a very relevant idea in the modern world to create social policies environmentalism environmentalists have been increasingly concerned by the interconnected nature of environmental degradation and the damages and consequences that happen to countries and societies because of some actions taken by some groups of societies in some part of the world environmentalists advocate for two kinds of things on one hand they are asking high consumption societies to reduce their consumption to consume less to consume less in order to do less damage to the earth and therefore there needs to be regulations within social policy or you need new kinds of social policy that regulates over consumption because over consumption leads to over use of natural resources natural resource degradation um it also it also means that one has to be conscious about what one wears what one eats how one travels yeah whether you eat food that is locally grown as against uh, food that comes to you from very far away yeah our consumption of fossil fuels uh is also dependent on the kind of lifestyles we have so one group of environmentalists are fully concerned about overconsumption and policies needed to reduce it there are others who believe that it is 
difficult to prevent people from consuming and if you want an economy to function well and the markets to perform well people to have jobs you cannot necessarily regulate consumption and there is this whole idea of liberalism liberal ideas mean that you are not supposed to interfere with people's liberties their freedom their choice to lead the kind of life that they would like to lead and hence rather than restrict people's consumption or try to regulate what they consume, it is much better then to use market instruments or mechanisms to make certain types of environmentally unsustainable use and practices uh, too expensive or unaffordable or penalties and fines associated with those kinds of uses. So according to them, ecosystem resources and services should be valued and cost put to it so that any individual government or societies that infringe on it or use too much of it simply pays for it. So what they suggest is instead of having regulations or social policies to ameliorate environmental degradation or regulate overconsumption, why not have market mechanisms to fix and regulate people's behavior? The notion of environmental justice, however, looks at a completely different dimension of how environmental issues should influence social policies. According to them, environmental damage that happens due to overconsumption in some parts of the world or certain types of economic growth or development creates hazards or creates disadvantages to low-income group people and poor people in other parts of the world who are actually not benefiting from such types of overconsumption or such types of economy. So basically people who pay the price for environmental destruction and damage are not the people who benefit from it. And therefore environmental justice, whether a social policy or an economic policy, is creating environmental justice or creating environmental injustice, basically causing poverty or reducing poverty needs to be a fundamental uh, you know, parameter with which to uh, determine whether it's a good social policy or not a very good one. Let us look at some other ideas about social policy and that have informed social policy. Utilitarianism is a really, really old way, old philosophy, and it's a theory of social choice whereby its measurement of the good is seen as want satisfaction. So basically, if your wants are satisfied, if your preferences are attained, and if you are happy, yeah, then you will not be considered deprived. So deprivation needs to be measured according to utilitarians in terms of whether people's preferences have been satisfied. And if individuals feel satisfied, then that is the perfect way to measure whether a social policy works or not. In utilitarianism, the concern of the responsible agent lies in delivering efficiency. Therefore, the action that best promotes maximum satisfaction is chosen. The main criticism of utilitarian thinking in social policy discourse is that certain actions or certain things that make people happy or make them feel generate a lot of satisfaction is not necessarily also attributes that make them healthy or make them well nourished or make them um, you know strong or make them believe in environmental or gender justice so how does how, how, how can you use happiness as a parameter for social policy? There's a great deal of debate in the world today whether happiness ideally, and there's surveys that, you know, they're creating a happiness index and trying to find out which parts of the world are people the happiest, and whether that has got anything to do with the countries where there's a lot of social policy as against countries where people are left primarily to their own devices. But the problem here and the criticism remains is of two things. A, if you go back to our definition of needs, yeah, it's, it's not an understanding of needs, it's simply an understanding of preferences. Certain people might be happy with their situations because that's always how they have been. Since they have never known any other way of being, they're adapted. So this is called adaptive preference. The adaptive preference criticism is the biggest criticism of utilitarianism in social policy because you're adapted and therefore you don't want anything else. And if we want to do fairness, justice, redistribution, etc., then happiness or want or satisfaction or preference satisfaction, basically utilitarianism is a poor guide for creating social policy. 
with this, we come to a conclusion. We have introduced some really heavy ideas here and uh, some, some philosophical thoughts. Some of you who are interested in learning more about it can go into specific types of resources that are freely available and also the reading list that is given with this module. So what are the things that we discussed in this module? We learned about key theoretical and ideological perspectives that have historically shaped decisions about social policies, including the decision whether to have social policies or not. You have been specifically introduced to the ideas of liberalism, newer forms of liberalism like neoliberalism, Marxism, feminism, environmentalism, and utilitarianism. While these do not exhaust all theoretical influences that have come to design and define social possibilities, it's a good starting point to develop a more analytical approach in looking at social policy. So when you look at a social policy now, any social policy anywhere in the world, you can look at it from a very macro perspective. You can look at it from a theoretical, philosophical point of view and decide that although it sounds good, but what is it? What kind of justice is it setting out to create for itself? And would it succeed? And what would be the consequences? Who would be the winners and who would be the losers? Environmentalism and feminism especially tells you to be highly alert about the winners and losers of specific types of social policy or not having social policy. Thank you.